Okay, so this will not be a long video, because... Well, with this topic, you can either do a whole course, and when I say a whole course, I mean... about 15 weeks two to three hour lectures each week and two or three hours of seminars each week easily and still not really scratch the subject or you can do roughly half an hour grand strategy well it's one of those topics which causes a lot of fun and a lot of discussion because it encompasses everything. It comes off as many things. There are many people who will say Grand Strategy is pointless. There are others who will say it has too many negative connotations, too many, it sounds too fancy. You know, you just have strategy, don't have ground strategy. But the point is, strategy in this context is the military. It's the application of force, or not a force. Grand strategy is everything that goes into making that possible. And that's really the difficulty, because once you start thinking about everything that goes into making the military actions possible, you start to realise that, frankly, everything is connected. And you start to come up with the reason why, when someone calls themselves a naval historian or a military historian, they still have to be a historian of all sorts of things. Because if they don't, they can't make sense of the naval and military affairs. And honestly, no historian can. Any historian who goes, well, I am just a historian of this particular area of history, this particular thing. That is a cachet title for the area which they are most interested in talking about. But they have to be a historian of everything involved because everything bleeds into everything else. Human life is not in distinct little boxes. Human life is messy by its very nature. There are consequences. There are connections. There are discussions. Human life is full, as is ground strategy. So let's start off, shall we? Shameless book plug. Always got to have it in there. But there is another book plug going on here as well. You can see over my shoulder here. Lawrence Freeman's History of Strategy. I've recommended it on this channel several times. It's sitting there with Andrew Lambert's British Way of War. And frankly, both are there for a reason. They're good introductions. But they're good introductions. I have a quote from Paul von Hoft here, which is one of the better quotes I've found recently on grand strategy. And this comes from the Oxford Bibliographies website, and there's a you can find it very easily if you Google it. Grand strategy is the highest level of national statecraft that establishes how States or other political units prioritize and mobilize which military, diplomatic, political, economic, and other sources of power to ensure that they are what they perceive as their interests. Depending on one's theoretical perspective, these perceived interests focus the most minimal goal of ensuring the state's survival, pursuing specific domestic interests or ideal, uh, ideal national coalitions, or establish a specific regional or global order. The grand editor concept is often used for grandiose or ambitious. However, it does not suggest expensive or expansive goals, but rather the managing of all the state's resources 
towards the means of the state's perceived ends. The concept emerged from the military domain and refers to what is necessary for the successful use of military force in wartime and peacetime. The latter includes non-use of military force, such as deterrence and coercion. The range of other instruments beyond military force is extensive, alliance building, diplomacy, economic policy, financial incentives, intelligence, public and dem uh, diplomacy, propaganda, and the mobilization of the nation's political will. Could be more easily written as, grand strategy is how you manage everything to protect and su succeed with everything. There is nothing there which is not interconnected with everything else. It has to be. So, grand strategy. Where does it come from? Well, I said it comes from the military side of things. But in many ways, grand strategy has been practiced for a very, very long time. Even when it's not called grand strategy, it's been factored and it's been thought about. And how can we tell this? How can we talk about grand strategy and say it ha is one of the few things which I can tell you has been practiced long before they had a name for the concept? That's an interesting thing. Because human beings are an interesting creature as we understand them. They're thinking creatures. In to an extent of they need an idea in order to grasp, uh, they need to have had an idea in order to action it. But grand strategy, another phrase can it, for it can be good government, long-term thinking. There is an old saying, and it was in a TV program a few years ago, and I looked it up and found it was true. Nations grow strong when old men plant trees, the shade of which they will never see. And basically that means nations, communities grow and become capable and, and strong and survivable when you start building stuff which you will never be able to use, but which will benefit the future generations. It's infrastructure. Portsmouth Royal Dockyard, founded 1496. Think about that. 1496. Today, this year is 2023. That's 527 years ago. Five hundred and twenty seven years. half a millennia of constant use. So, yeah, that's grand strategy. Before we even come up with the phrase grand strategy, you're building a dockyard and you keep investing in it and you keep developing it why what does that dockyard do that dockyard can't fight wars for you well it can because without that dockyard you can't build and maintain your fleet and without a fleet out of fleet you can't fight a war so on your side you need an actual fleet of warships you can call upon leaderships you can call upon and use when you, when you need as a government rather than relying on hiring vessels etc. You have to start studying up into the realms of grand strategy. 
you start having to think, well, okay, I need infrastructure here. I need a, fl I need a fleet. Well, then you need to start organizing the wood. You need to start organizing the money to pay for it. You need to start organizing all the administration of it. Everything to maintain it in peacetime for when you need it in wartime. Its existence in peacetime is a measure of your strength, of your capability, of your commitment to your sovereignty and your protection. In other words, without this, what have you got? With this, you've got a lot. So infrastructure. Think about the time it takes to build most projects. When someone starts talking about railway lines, etc., and they give you the phrase of, well, it's going to cost this much money, and in five years it's only going to do this. Then they're showing you how incapable of government they really are. Railway lines, their return is not measured in five years. It's not measured in 50 years. It should be measured in about 100 years. Infrastructure is that. When you start thinking of infrastructure in terms of five-year returns, you don't build future-proofed infrastructure. You actually are on a hiding to nothing because in five years' time, you have to build something else or you have to go and build that project which you're going to build that would have lasted 100 years anyway. And then when you start looking broader, because you have strategy around the world, you have commitments, interests around the world, you have economic needs because you're connected into the world by trade, by movement of goods, by commerce by insurance, if you're looking specific case of Britain, then you're probably going to need bases around the world as well. Now, people often go, well, you know, you can build these bases very quickly when you need more time. You can build forward operating bases very quickly in more time. Theatre level strategic bases that will have huge amounts of resources and infrastructure in them they're far more difficult to build. And the more complex and more technologically advanced your weapon systems get, the more those bases become even more critical. And the more constructing them becomes even more important. Because if you think about it now, we're talking about modern aircraft which need their not just their airframes checked, but the actual skin of the aircraft checked to ensure their survivability in combat, to ensure that they are the correct, their correct properties for radar absorption and to provide them with a stealth capability, are viable. That needs to be checked. That's not easy or cheap equipment. That's not cheap in terms of the resources of the people, the stores. In the 17th century, you were talking about having a store of seasoned wood, spars, and masts. Things that could allow you to rapidly repair ships. Cannon. Nowadays, well, you need a store of engine parts, but you also probably need a store of microchips and radars, and gun barrels, ammunition, missiles, shells, everything. Because here's the problem. Where your interests are, and where your nation is, are not mutually dependent. They can, in fact, be very, very exclusive of each other. When someone turns to a board and goes, Ah, this country's in this part of the world, so therefore it should just focus on this area, they are being 
very, very limited in their thinking. First thing you have to ask yourself is, what is that econ a nation's economy? What is it based on? If it's based on trade, it's based, if it's an island nation especially, it's probably going to be heavily involved in trade and commerce because the odds are islands usually don't have access to as much natural resources as they wish. They usually have very highly advanced populations. Reason? They have the sea for a food source and a communication source, which has meant that they've managed to grow up being able to communicate around quite easily, which tends to grow their economy naturally, which means they reach the point at which they no longer have sufficient resources for the nation as qui more quickly than others, in which case they start trading with others for those resources. They export what quality they have to them, or sometimes they go to one place with, their, with things they can export to them, Sell them for the goods that they get there. Take those goods to a third place, to a third place basically, and sell those goods they've got from the second place there, and then uh, then buy in the third place what they need back in their home. Sometimes it gets even more complicated than that. Then we have training. It's part of, again, the commitment to infrastructure. Training. Providing a constant base of training and renewal. Now, again, this is one of those things which has come on later in terms of its formalized nature. But when you find governments are starting to worry about the quality and training of the personnel in their armed forces, that means they're looking to make those armed forces as effective as they can be. You want your personnel to be well trained because if they're well trained, they're going to be as capable as they can be. One of the things that's often less well understood is that training is a lifesaver, quite literally. So, let's say you have about, you have five hundred troops, and your opponent has a thousand. You drill and train your troops regularly. They are led by competent officers who are well tested and NCOs. The other person has a thousand. They want to save money. They just basically pull them in, arm them, and send them to war. The odds are those thousand troops will be lost, a large number of them. The enemy might be able to easily send another thousand, another thousand. But the reality is, the first 500 of your troops will probably beat them all. Why? Because it takes a lot more than numbers of 2 to 1 to beat quality. Because well-trained troops tend to understand the metrics of what they're fighting and can adjust their, tra adjust their positions to deal with that. Now, of course, you can go, well, if we go back to the age of spears, what can happen when you've got a 1,000 versus 500? You just spread out and you go round, uh, go round the sides and envelop them. True. But 500 smart troops won't pick a position like that, will they? They won't pick a position where you can do that. They'll pick a position which suits them. They'll find a position which suits them. Or they'll make a position which suits them. Again, the training comes in here. They'll build a defensive structure. They'll shake the land. They'll have options. Which the thousand won't necessarily think of. Or be able to accomplish even if they do think of. Training matters. Now, of course, I could have put up Dartmouth. I could have put up any of the officer schools which have been around far longer. I can talk about the apprenticeship system, which really uh, realistically existed when midshipmen were taken on by ships, and then they go through their training years at sea, and then they be put up by the captains for lieutenants' examinations, and 
once they pass those examinations would then get postings and go through the training and have to complete the service and do well. But really, the fact it exists, the fact that a system like that exists, is grand strategy. Because, again, it's committing resources. It's committing resources in peacetime. Resources which, you know, those are resources you have to get from somewhere. Think about that. You have to tax, and again for this, research. You have to tax the economy to get money. So you have to employ people to go and get money. So you can spend money on training people when you're not even at war. For when you are at war. In order to have the options available. That's a lot of steps. Someone who is a pure accountant can tell you, well... I could save all this money by just not training them, then I don't, uh, not training them, employing them in the first place. Then I don't have to employ and train them to go and collect the tax money, uh, the money in taxation. And then I don't have to raise those taxes, which is going to probably make the public happier in the short term because they won't be taxed. And everyone likes to have low taxes. It's brilliant! But the trouble is, what happens very quickly is countries which follow that policy, if they are large countries with things which people want, well, as well as not investing in troops, they won't be investing in research. So they won't have the technology. And when I say they won't have the technology, they can have very high-tech research companies in them. They can be doing all sorts of wondrous things. And you can use examples of this from history. You can say they have this technology, that technology. But they don't have the availability in terms of research. They haven't, and the research the military tends to spend a lot of money, its money on, is how to turn things from the abstract, brilliant science into the reality in volume that they can use it. Because in having a one-off version of something amazing doesn't really help if you're a military. You tend to need a lot of them. So a lot of research spending in terms of military research spending doesn't go into developing new novel things. It goes into how to turn this novel thing into something we can have in volume. Which is again another thing which is often misunderstood about grand strategy and research because they look at that and they go, well that's surely a waste, we should be inventing new things, new things. That's wonderful. I have all these wonderful things which I can't use. Because I have one of them. And it's a test bed model. Because it's not just turning into something which can be produced in volume. It's turning into something which can be produced in volume and used by your sailors, your soldiers, your airmen. It can be used by them. And that's, that's tough. Now, you can make your life a little easier by actually training those personnel, because the better trained they are, the more advanced equipment you can give them, which actually then saves money on the research and actually allows you to use better equipment because you don't have to dumb it down quite so much. Now, that sounds rude. Please expl let me explain. If we consider the components which will be used on things which are in the, in the average advanced research laboratory, where most of the people going around even have masters, let alone PhDs, and spend their entire lives focusing on that one piece of equipment, and it's used in sterile conditions in a beautiful lab, versus what do you want to be using a person who is tired, has a... Mm, a million and one other things going through their mind at that time because they're in combat. Um, it's They're dirty, they're messy, there's rain coming down, and they're having to use the piece of equipment. Let's be honest, there is a big difference between the mental capacity to use a piece of equipment in that scenario than there is in the, for, uh, in the first scenario. 
And that's grand strategy, doing that, investing in that money, working out what is worthwhile to invest in, or just investing in general and seeing what works out. It's a national identity. Grand strategy is about building a national identity as well. Now, one of the things you'll see recently is there's lots of things about you know, various phrases around Britannia rules the raves and all these things. And there's lots of strange ideas about Britons never, sh never, sh never, never shall be slaves. There was a reason for the inclusion of that line. For a long time, for Britain, before the Royal Navy was really stood up properly, and one of the reasons why various rulers had navies was because of Moorish raiders coming up from North Africa and attacking places in Cornwall, in Devon, and the south coast mainly, but also sometimes Scotland, and taking slaves. I know about this history, and this is quite it's well known history in certain parts, but this history is quite well known to my family because part of my family got very rich fighting these people. There was no navy at the time, really, and my family were able, had a ship, and were happy to do the job. So, hired. Mm hmm. It's beautiful. But. This is part of British history. And part of the reason Britain as an island develops a navy is because of our economic interests, but part of it is also because of this. Because we couldn't stop people at a nice nice land position. We couldn't didn't have a nice mountain range. We only had the sea. And the sea is only a moat if you can patrol it and command it. Otherwise, instead of being a moat, it's a highway straight to you. So this forces you to start thinking in terms of long term. I was discussing this the other day um, in a brew ships when I was talking about some of the books about the Chinese Navy and some of that's coming up for um, the video on the Battle of Yemen. And one of the things that's sort of distinct is the Chinese are able to build a lot more ships than the British ever really build at any one time. Yet the British ships tend to last for longer because the British will invest long term in seasoning and seasoning the wood and leaving it for longer. Whereas the Chinese are happy to do that for some ships, but the vast majority, they don't see the point because they're just building more ones. And the difference is one is a primarily land empire at that time. So for them, the navy is something which they're building to react to circumstance and deal with what the, deal with problems they've got, not necessarily something which they are essentially dependent upon. And they have a far larger volume of people to call upon to man this navy and crew this navy. Whereas another one, the other power is... The sea is its moat, is its strategic depth, and it needs to dominate it. And it only has limited resources in terms of people, in terms of uh, uh, personnel, in terms of personnel, in terms of funding, in terms of resources. And so it needs to a build up a national identity that's entrapped it to support it, but also it needs to build up huge depth of that resource and the best way to do that is to make ships last longer because if you can build fewer at any one time you want them to last as long as they can and this all comes down to the economy now first duty you often hear people talk about first duty of government is national defense and national security but a part of ground strategy which has to be remembered is the economy a nation which can't pay its bills, which can't get a good line of debt when it needs to for emergencies such as war, which can't support industrially its needs for a military for its military need its military needs is is going to be in problems. It's going to have a strategic issue. 
Now, in Britain, we often have a problem, and I will say this quite often, the Treasury can be so obsessed with disprotection of the economy that they forget the other parts of grand strategy. And the thing is, at times in history, the Treasury is a senior, is first amongst equal in departments, but it's not an overarching dominant department. It's become a dominant department in, pre in recent years. Which has seen some of the issues that we've seen today created. But it's always needed to be a very important department because without it, you can't support or sustain any of the other departments. The economy has to be looked into and supported. And again, it's something long term. You know, why do you want to have an edu a national education system? Why do you want to have a national health system? It's because whilst they cost money, they long term are a benefit to the economy. They provide stability. They provide a happier workforce. They provide a better quality workforce. They provide a workforce which is hopefully going to be more sustaining. And also, they provide a workforce which will be available for longer. So investments, you're more likely to invest in those workers because they're more likely to be around for longer. So it's worthwhile investing in them and training them. The basic problem with grand strategy is it is all long-term thinking. And if you can see places around you which you think are no longer good at it, it's because often they have, to an extent, forgotten the long-term thinking. Long-term isn't thinking in terms of the next five years. It isn't even thinking in terms of... It's procuring assets which are going to be available for the next 30 to 40 years. It's thinking about infrastructure for the next 100 years. There are some good examples of that. I would argue many of the crossrails, many of the railway lines being put in are examples of next 100 years thinking. If you think about the London Underground, that's been around for a very, very long time and is still very, very heavily used. And one of the interesting things is my view on that is that it's probably still going to be used even if we change our patterns in working from home. I'm off to uni again today. But I work from home a lot. I still use the underground a lot whenever I'm traveling through London, etc. That connectivity, the ability to move around when you need to, is always going to be an important part of infrastructure. It's always going to be necessary. And it's always going to be useful. I will say getting the train to work at the moment because of not having a car is really, really slow compared to having a car. But why am I bringing that up? Because again, that's another part of infrastructure. It's having an economy strong enough to support an infrastructure tool like roads where people have to have enough people have to have enough money to be able to sustain and run their own car and one of the interesting things you have with all of this when you start thinking about it is the long term nature of it because if you consider um, one of the very I think I saw one of the very good physicist put this, um, what did he say? He said, you know, it's one of the greatest things of history that car companies got people to pay taxes to build roads so that they could sell cars to those people to use on those roads. Think about that and you go, yeah. But then you start thinking about it and go, hang on, roads have been around longer than the car has. There were roads before that. There were roads before cars. Ooh, why? Because moving ho uh, because horse and carts are really not comfortable moving on tracks. Even on roads, it's not that great, but it's better than moving on tracks which are rutted and terribly maintained. And you're going to move a lot faster when you're marching along a road. Roads have been invested in for a long, long time. And that's infrastructure. That's... That's grand strategy. Building roads. Building railways. 
building a society. It's all about keeping everything going. Ultimately, grand strategy comes down to this. It's the art of how you keep your nation going. You protect your nation in wartime, you preserve it in peacetime, and how you keep it going in between everything. Grand strategy isn't necessarily about winning or achieving anything other than survival. But ultimately, it is about long-term thinking. So next time, you hear someone talking about infrastructure projects. And they're talking about five-year payoffs. Be very worried about infrastructure, that infrastructure project, because it's not, probably not designed to last. But if they're talking about it and saying it doesn't pay off in five years, it's, t it's t far too long in terms of viability, then have a look at it and start thinking, well, yeah, but how long is it supposed to last for? Five years? Ten years? Fifty years? Hundred years? And then think about when it starts paying off in that span. It's long term. And it's grand strategy. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that. And, um, yeah. Thank you for watching. I know this is not, not as long as my normal videos are. But as said, it can either be half an hour. Or it can be an entire year. Take care, have a nice day, and um, thank you for watching. Let's just see what we've got coming up this week. We've got the attack on Copenhagen 1801, and then we have the Battle of Yaman, which will be a premiere, not a live, because, as I said before, that's Mothering Sunday in the UK, and I like my limbs. I like breathing. So no, not doing that. We've got the glorious 1st of June, on the 1st of June in 1794. That's going to be the only scheduled live in June. Hopefully you'll be hearing about why soon. And, well, thank you very much for watching. Take care, everyone.